Welcome to this webinar on the topic of dominant currencies and the limits of exchange rate flexibility. So I recently asked Twitter, uh, do you think there might be too many webinars? Uh, and 803 likes and 98 retweets later, uh, I, I think the answer might be yes. And I can feel the organizers of this event wincing as I, as I say that, um, but I just want to state for the record um, that this one is going to be a really, really good one um, for three reasons. This meeting is being recorded. So number one, uh, the question uh, of how countries adjust to shocks uh, is really important. In case you haven't noticed, we are experiencing uh, quite a few shocks right now. Um, so it's a, it's a pertinent question. Two. There are new things to say. So today, um, the IMF published a staff discussion note by Gita and a long list of co-authors, and I would encourage everyone to go and read it. It's, it's, a, it's a gripping read. Uh, there is also a working paper and, and a blog out, which I'm sure the IMF will be, will be disseminating widely. So, so watch out for those. Number three, we have a set of really, really good speakers. Now, I've, I've participated in a fair few webinars, um, and in general, I'd say hot takes and hot air are um, in, in vast supply. Um, I don't think we're going to get very much of that today. Um, so obviously, our, our panelists don't need any introduction, but I have to pretend I serve a purpose. So uh, first of all, we will be hearing from Gita Gopinath, who is the chief economist at the IMF. Then we're going to be hearing from Philip Lane, who is on the ECB's executive board and is also its chief economist. Then we'll hear from Ana Fernanda Maguashka, who is a member of the board of directors at the Central Bank of Colombia. And finally, Hyun Song Shin, who is the head of research at the Bank for International Settlements. After Gita presents and the rest of the panel offers their remarks, we have a set of very distinguished quizzes in the front row. Uh, and then, Dear audience, uh, it is your turn. So please, for those of you watching this on WebEx, do submit your questions and I will try to pick the most challenging ones. And with that, it is time for Gita to take it away. Hi, Somaya. Thank you so much uh, for launching this off. Uh, I think you're right about the number of webinars, but we try to keep make this interesting. <laughs> we have a, a, a great panel. Uh, and a, a, a great set of people contributing to this. So uh, I, I'm looking forward to learning um, during the session. So um, what I'm going to do <clears throat> is share my slides. Uh, this, let me just put that out there. Okay, it's not letting me share my slides right now. Is there something that... Okay, I think now you're not the presenter, so it should let me... Okay. Okay, so... Let me just give you a very uh, quick overview on uh, one a staff discussion note uh, that we are putting out today. This is on dominant currencies and external adjustment. Uh, there are several uh, authors of this, co-authors of this report, as you can see in terms of names, and you know a lot of thinking and work went into this. <clears throat> a second uh, uh, piece of work that we are launching is a new joint ECB IMF data set on the patterns in invoicing currency in global trade. This has been a very exciting collaboration with the, with the ECB and I thank them for that. Uh, this database basically doubles the sample of countries for which we have trade invoicing information. So now we have about 100 countries in the database. Uh, for many of them, the data starts in the early 1990s, where we have wide coverage. Uh, there are still some countries that, you know, that we, we don't have the data for, but this is a, a live project, it's ongoing. And so as and when we get more data, we will continue updating them, not just cross country, but also over time. So this database has been used uh, in the analysis that I'm going to show you 
uh, show you next. Okay, so just very quick, uh, I don't think this question needs much introduction, but this, goes, this is a question for the times. It's central to open economy macroeconomics, which is what role do exchange rates play in facilitating external adjustment, right? Uh, and we've had a, a lot of theoretical contributions on this front and, and empirical contributions in this front. But the landscape of global trade uh, has changed. Uh, we have, as emerging and developing uh, economies, have become much bigger players in the global economy. Now, they are some of the biggest contributors to global trade. And so it's an interesting point to kind of stop and ask about, uh, does this then change something about how exchange rates provide insulation for uh, these economies, emerging and developing economies? Now, the conventional wisdom, uh, you know, it's been around for a while, uh, and you could go back to the original Mandel Fleming um, and the Nobel Prize that Mandel won for this, uh, was that export prices get set in the exporter's currency, which means they tend to be sticky in the exporter's currency. And if that's the case, when a country's currency depreciates relative to its trading partners, then it makes its exports cheaper from the perspective of its trading partners. Uh, and that leads to an increase in demand for the country's exports and an increase in, uh, in exports coming out of that country. At the same time, you also get a contraction in imports in the country whose currency is depreciated because you're, everything you're buying from the rest of the world has become more expensive. So this is the standard expenditure switching channel, uh, and that can give you strong expansionary effect. Now, the second uh, aspect of, uh, of international uh, trade, and if you look at firms, is that, of course, they finance themselves. And many firms, not just exporters, but even domestic firms in emerging markets, use uh, foreign currency borrowing. So now exchange rate movements also have a so-called balance sheet effect, affect their financing. And that has implications for uh, how they're going to respond to a weaker currency. So when you have a weaker currency, that's going to have an effect. Now, if on the other hand, the assumption is that firms finance in their own currency, then there is no such negative balance sheet uh, effect. Now, the empirical evidence is that what we actually see in the world is that countries price and finance in a few international currencies. And this is actually true even for many advanced economies, but it's also particularly true for emerging developing economies. So we're asking the following questions here, which is how do trade volumes react to exchange rate movement? How do balance sheet effects impact trade flows? And importantly, how does the pricing aspect and the financing aspect interact in understanding this adjustment? So very quickly, if you look at pricing currencies, what you see, and this is again from the new database on the left chart, that the vast majority of invoicing in international trade is done in dollar terms. And you can see that if you look at the upper left corner, you're going to see a large number of circles over there, which basically tell you that there are a whole bunch of countries that their exports to the U.S. are, you know, less than 20 percent of their overall exports, but they rely very heavily on dollar invoicing, which is over 80 percent of their invoicing to these other countries are done in, in dollar terms. So there's a whole lot of trade that takes place between uh, a, a country A and a country, one country and another where the U.S. is on either side of the trade transaction, but that gets done in dollar terms. Now, the euro also gets used, uh, especially for within the euro area, but also within uh, some countries in Europe that trade heavily with countries in the euro area and some countries in, uh, in Africa. The right-hand side chart shows you exactly the U.S. dollar invoicing by country group. So the U.S., of course, does almost entirely all of its exports in terms of dollar terms. But that's, you know, if you look at other countries, most of them are not doing exports in terms of their own currency. So if you look at the euro area and you exclude intra-EU trade, you know, about 30, 35 percent of uh, exports going out of this, of this region are actually priced in dollars. 
the other AE bar tells you that shows you 60% of other AE exports are priced in dollars. And for emerging market and developing economies as a whole, this is the red bar. You can see we're getting close to close to 80%. So this is, um, this, these, are, these are the facts. What the data tells you is that these have been relatively stable over the last 20, 25 years or so, despite the fact that the U.S.'s share in global trade has come down. Uh, you know, the dollar's dominance in global trade has, has remained strong. Right, okay. So what does this what what does this imply then the fact that you have this kind of pricing in dollar terms? Well, the left hand side graph shows you is that you know when if you take a country and you look and you know it's pricing internationally in dollar terms and you look at what happens when it's a currency depreciates relative to everybody else, then of course the price of its export in its own currency is going to go up by a lot. Which is, as, which is kind of the opposite of what you would expect from uh, a Mundell Fleming assumption that you're pricing your own currency. Because if you're pricing in your own currency, that price is sticking, it doesn't change much. But here you see a very high pass through. And what's important, as you see in the short term, is that the US dollar's value relative to the current currency is really what determines the home currency price of the good and much less the bilateral exchange rate. So it's, it's saying that if I look at, say, trade between a hypothetical example, trade between Mexico and India, what really matters for the peso price of exports going from Mexico to India is the peso dollar exchange rate as opposed to the peso rupee exchange rate. Over the medium term, you can see that the, the bilateral and the dollar exchange rate becomes about equally important. And the right-hand side tells you the quantity movement. So again, what you see there is that countries that invoice in their exporter's currency, which is again traditional Mandel Fleming, you get about a 10% depreciation, uh, about a, over a little bit over a 1% increase in the quantity exported, but you just don't have that effect when the invoicing is done in dollar terms. It's practically close to zero. On the other hand, with imports, you do see the same effect as one would expect because everything you're buying internationally has become more expensive in either case. And so you get a contraction in imports. What the right hand tells you is that over time, which is over a three year period, exports start going, going, responding. Again, not as much as one would in the case where the invoicing is in the export of currency, but you still get a steam, an effect. So what's the difference there? I don't think that's been completely nailed as to what's you know, completely driving the medium term effect, but here are some possibilities. One is that prices tend to be uh, stickier over a shorter duration as compared to wages. And so then at some point it become flexible, but wages are still sticky, you get this effect. Secondly, firms make uh, profits when they're, when they're exporting in dollar terms and the currency weakens relative to the dollar, they make profits and that profitability then shows up in higher exports uh, in the future. Uh, this is a quick a snapshot of services trade. What was there before was manufacturing trade, but now this is services trade. Uh, and so you can ask the question about, well, do we see the same kind of behavior in services trade? This is a new data, this is some new data that's being used for this analysis. Now, the truth of the matter is that we don't have invoicing information for services trade. And also, we don't get separately, for a lot of services trade, you don't get separately prices and quantities. So it's not as easy to make this analysis. But what you do see in terms of explaining the value of services trade, the dollar does play a role. Uh, but, you know, the distinction between the bilateral and the dollar is less severe as compared to in the, in the goods trade. But if you look at sectors, for instance, like IT services, you know, computer services, transport, in those cases, even in those services sector, you see a, a, a role for the US dollar in terms of explaining the value of those trade flows. Now, the right-hand side shows you the, the one kind of services trade where the dollar is really not that important, and that is on tourism. And so here we actually have quantity information on the response of tourist arrivals to depreciation. And here you see it's, true, it's a bilateral exchange that really does matter in driving tourism flows, which, which makes sense because a lot of tourism activities are doing kind of are local and, and are obviously on the ground. 
uh, and they're priced in their own home currencies. And so you would expect to see this kind of more traditional uh, expenditure switching effect. Now let's look at financing currencies. Financing currencies, you see, for emerging markets, there are they do uh, a significant amount they're borrowing also in foreign currencies. You can see that for emerging market economies. What we've seen from disparate sources of evidence is that also the dollar plays a very important role here. So what does that imply? It implies that if a country's currency depreciates and suppose you have a mismatch, which is that the revenues that you earn are not in dollar terms, but you have to pay these, uh, you, you know, these liabilities that you have in dollar terms, then when the currency weakens, it's not good for you, it's bad for your balance sheet, that can raise your financing costs. Uh, and then can, that can then lead you to cut back on imports from the rest of the world and not allow you to export as much. But of course, like I said, it does depend upon what, what your revenues are in uh, relative to what your costs are in. Uh, and here is where you see the interaction between the pricing role of the dollar and the financing role of the dollar. Uh, and here you can see that in, in the case of exporters who price internationally in dollar terms, they're already naturally hedged to some extent. Uh, and so if you see on the right-hand side, if you look at the impact on imports, uh, and you look at the difference between non-exporters, which is the orange bar, which has a longer length, as compared to imports of exporters, you don't really see the effect on, on uh, import purchases of exporters. But if you look at non-exporters, which are those who are importing from outside and then selling domestically, when you, in that case, when the currency depreciates, they do get a financing channel hit and they cut back on imports. Okay, so just to uh, summarize, what are the general implications of dominant currency pricing? You see Tebit export volume responses in the short term, uh, some more balanced responses in the medium term. When you have dominant currency financing, you have a limited impact on exporting firms, but it amplifies the import response. So basically what dominant currency financing does is that it's just, it amplifies the cutback in import purchases from the rest of the world. Combined together, uh, it, it points to the fact that exchange rates have weaker insulating properties in the short term. Now you do get some insulation, but they are, uh, they are weaker, which means that in the short term, it may require larger exchange rate movement. And uh, that will call for other kinds of supportive policies, uh, something that we're discussing in the as part of the integrated policy framework. So let me come to my last slide, which is what are the implications of this work for the great lockdown? So, you know, we've projected global trade to collapse by 12% in 2020. Of course, the vast majority of that is basically the, coming from the collapse in global demand and the breakdown of global supply chain. Now, a question you could ask is that, well, is there, is there still the fact that emerging market currencies that have depreciated, are they going to see some expenditure switching effect that comes even from this depressed demand? Uh, and what the evidence seems to say is that the, the likelihood of that is small because there is, uh, you know, firstly exports to most of the U.S. and advanced economies are going to be muted due to the U.S. dollar invoicing. When the dollar appreciates uniformly relative to all currents, you know, the trading partners, uh, and you saw that for some periods of this crisis, uh, then that, if anything, leads to a cutback in demand from your trading partners for your goods. So even if they're not, if we, even if their currency has been moved relative to yours, because everybody is pricing in dollar terms, that's going to make their imports more expensive and they're going to come back. And the third factor, which is quite important for this crisis, is that, you know, like I showed you, tourism is one sector that is particularly sensitive to exchange rate movements, but this is a crisis where tourism is likely to be depressed, you know, even relative to other sectors as you open up. And so that channel is also impaired. So if anything, this could have an additional contractionary effect on global trade. Uh, the negative balance, and there's also the negative balance sheet effects as we've seen because uh, with the currency weak, uh, with their em emerging market currencies that are weakened relative to the dollar, uh, and that can lead to some import uh, compression. So that again amplifies the contractionary effect. So just to, um, uh, conclude, collective sizable emerging and developing on depreciations may provide uh, limited short-term support to their economies, 
although they can uh, provide support, or more substantial support over the medium term, uh, which also then means that it's key to use other policy levers to support the economy. Uh, so with that, I will stop. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, that was that was super interesting, as I as I predicted. Um, okay. So uh, first of all, I would love to uh, invite comments uh, from Philip Lane. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, depending where you are. Uh, so I'm very pleased to be invited to join this panel because I, I do think actually this uh, dominant currency. Uh, pricing, dominant currency, uh, financing framework is really, I think, should be the benchmark. Um, and like many innovations, at one level, it's super simple, and uh, it may it also uh, raises the question: Why, if it's so obvious, were we not already uh, fo following this framework? So uh, let me congratulate the authors for, for for the development of this work and uh, and the step forward in, in the staff discussion of today and the new data set now of course uh, uh, at one level this this is it's a natural progression because uh, you know the, for decades we have small open economy models where where the small economy is a price taker in foreign currency and uh, the, the uh, fin financial system is, is heavily dollarized but you know uh, these models uh, typically were just uh, home versus the rest of the world, whereas the nuance with dominant uh, currency uh, framework is, is you have to make the distinction between uh, trading partners and dominant currencies, and you get a lot of strong predict predictions, which, as Gita just presented, uh, tends to work out in in the data. Now, I I do think. Uh, of course, in the very compressed uh, time uh, that, that Gita had, not all of the uh, nuances uh, were brought out. But there is a kind of very interesting uh, distinction here because, you know, I think it's fairly clear and uh, some of the front row members have worked hard to show why it's natural to have a dominant currency in, in finance, why we do tend to have these, uh, you know, currently the dollar as the lead currency. Whereas with trade, it's always a bit of a puzzle. I mean, a lot of emerging markets, depending where they are in the world, um, whereas you know, it looks like the dollar is far more important outside of the greater European region uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, dominant currency pricing. By the way, uh, you know, there's a lot of extensions of this work. Um, as Gita mentioned, uh, uh, within the euro area, we, we have this very strong pattern, which is uh, within the euro area, trade is in euro. So if you like, uh, in terms of thinking about what, what is the gain to forming a single currency or equivalently what was the uh, sacrifice uh, by sharing dominant currency status among the member countries, not only is trade within the euro area, if you like, uh, stabilized in terms of uh, of having the same currency, but also imports from the rest of the world. I mean, we do see uh, exporters into the euro area, at least regionally, at, at our pricing in, in euro, which is stabilizing, uh, to, depending on the mechanism uh, for euro area members. Uh, one interesting effect I saw in the data set is for mid-sized European countries, so if you take the UK, uh, Sweden, or Denmark, a lot of the exports to these countries are either priced in euro or in dollars. So if you like, even for those mid-sized countries, it's, it's, it's important to think about this issue about the, the currency denomination of exports. Now, I think uh, the, the, it's a nice uh, new data set which shows the value of joint uh, Cooperation with ECB and uh, others. Uh, and I think uh, one important result that Gita highlighted there was essentially the very different uh, pattern for importers compared to exporters because of the natural hedge uh, exporters have if they have foreign currency revenue and, and foreign currency debt. I think it's also important uh, uh, the point she made about the differences between manufacturing and services, uh, and especially, uh, say, if you like labor intensive. Uh, locally produced services such as tourism, which of course is a big topic this year. Let me mention how one area for possible extension is the decision-making of multinational firms. 
because of course uh, one way uh, a sustained currency depreciation can work is by changing the economics of where multinationals should locate their operations. And I think actually in terms of medium term adjustment, um, I think we've seen it here in Europe in the last decade, and I'm sure it's elsewhere, which is uh, one of the most important ways uh, 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 economies are affected by currency movements is through this FDI channel and the role of foreign affiliates. Uh, so I, I think that, that that's something which uh, may have to explain the stronger medium term patterns than the uh, near term patterns. But let me uh, maybe just before uh, uh, finishing up emphasize uh, maybe selfishly from a euro area point of view. So if, if I take a euro area perspective and think about the implications of, of this dominant currency framework for, for how we think about the world. Of course, uh, when we think about the euro dollar rate, which is the most uh, trade rate in the world, at one level, uh, you know, we can think of just, you know, the bilateral linkages between the US and the euro area, where I think producer currency pricing gets you a long way. But, you know, I think the rest of the world is now quite large compared to the size of the US and euro area, area economies. And therefore, quantitatively, we do have to bring in this dominant currency paradigm. The impact of a uh, euro dollar rate movements on the European economy does depend on on the uh, impact on global trade volumes, uh, both through the those who price in dollars and uh, regionally those who price in, in euro. But let me, of course, make a point is compared to every country making their own decisions, uh, especially in times of uh, large currency movements, uh, maybe some of the effects are kind of uh, affected by the fact that the Fed now provides dollar swaps and repos uh, to, to a range of counterparties. And this year, given the COVID shock, uh, the ECB is, has uh, been doing more than uh, previous the, uh, the swaps that very closely connect to the economies and more extensive uh, repos at a, at a regional level. And then maybe the uh, the last point you know I'll make is uh, the, the seminar is focusing on external adjustment, but of course, exchange rates move for many reasons, only one of which is external adjustment. Uh, we also think about the response to exchange rates to risk shocks, uh, to monetary policy shocks, and, and so on. And here, what's interesting, of course, is I think part of uh, the philosophy of the, the work is essentially uh, the stronger medium term uh, channels uh, on exporting. Uh, exporting exporters may not respond very quickly in the short run, but more so in the medium run. And I think uh, that that's very relevant because, of course, a lot of the discussion about exchange rates, equilibrium exchange rates, such as in the external balance assessment of the IMF, uh, is really about the medium term, uh, much more so than the short term. But uh, I would say that this dominant currency framework is very helpful in tracing out the dynamic response understanding that the short term responses will be heavily influenced by the dominant currency issues, even if the underlying uh, macroeconomics uh, bears out over the medium term. Okay, so next we're going to hear from uh, Anna Fernanda Maguashka. And, and so here I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, about the Colombian experience, right, where, the, where there is a flexible exchange rate regime. So, so what lessons can we draw from that? Okay, thank you, Sumaya. And uh, I want to first of all thank the IMF for this invitation and for the note and the working paper. And, and thank also the ECB. I think it's it's extremely important to have these kinds of discussions in this juncture in which we are also facing so many irregularities as as to how we are seeing the shocks and the adjustments work. And also very happy to say to and I was very excited to read the work of my colleague and ex-colleague uh, from Banco de la Republica, Camila Casas and Carolina Osorio. So I'm going to share some slides. Uh, I hope they're short enough just to show you a bit how has our reflection upon the effects of an ex ex uh, flexible exchange rate which has worked in Colombia. So let me just, I, if I could have, um, thank you, I think we're here. Okay, so this is just to show you a bit what we have finally basically seen in our experience. 
So the evidence from Colombia gives a very preeminent role to the flexible exchange rate in the reduction of currency mismatches. Um, and here I'm showing you how the debt comp denomination composition has changed over time. We see that the local currency uh, denomination for debt in 2000, which was the first year in which we went into a flexible exchange rate, amounted to 48% of the total non-finance uh, corporate debt. And then when we see the numbers for 2019, we, saw, we see that local currency indebtedness went up to 65% in this proportion. So we do see um, that this has a, a very important effect that has allowed actually policy to benefit from enhanced expenditure switching effects uh, on tradable goods. And then if I may, um, I try to illustrate here how that tradable demand behaved in the last terms of trade shock that we had and that was very substantial in the case of the Colombian economy for the effects of the oil price shock. And then how the non-tradable demand uh, behaves in a, such a smooth manner, protecting, let's say, uh, output on the overall. And how at the end of the day, what we're seeing is that the volatility of exchange rate has allowed for in the interest rate stabilization. And uh, this contributes to output stabilization, and maybe it could have something to do uh, with the story that we see in the, in the paper's uh, view of the financing channel, in the sense that most importers do find the possibility of uh, switching from external currency indebtedness to local currency indebtedness, since we see that we have had a very strong stabilizing effect on our local interest rates. I'm showing here the 90-day conditional vol for both exchange rates and interest rates. On the second part of my comment, I wanted to draw uh, probably your attention into some other avenues in which I think this work can be extended, particularly as seeing that once we went from the impacts in trade and then we saw how this could be enhanced or not. Uh, by the way, that the finance structure of importers and exporters was built. There are some other uh, stylized facts that we find in the Colombian economy, uh, in which I believe it's important that we that we look in that direction. In the case of Colombia, we have found that a large part uh, of the automatic stabilization that we saw in the 2014 shock came from the net primary income account. Uh, I'm showing you here the balance of goods uh, for a longer period of time, but you can plainly see how this shock affected us uh, when we had the oil price very strong drop in 2014. Under counter cyclicality, let's call it that way in this manner, of the net primary income in trying to uh, or in achieving actually to adjust or support a large part of the adjustments. So we actually saw import contraction bear around two thirds of, of that adjustment, but a large third of it was, was, was on the shoulders of, of this net primary income account. And I think that although a, a part of that, of our FDI comes into commodity production, there is a large part and an increasing part of non-oil and mining FDI coming into the country. And I think that exchange rate dynamics might be influencing the dollar value of these non-commodity profit remittances. Uh, and the joint impact renders a strong automatic, automatic stabilizing effect in the external imbalance. And I think that that, that that could be sort of an important avenue in terms of uh, seeing other impacts of the exchange rate in the adjustment processes. To a lesser extent, uh, but in any case, something that might be important to other uh, small open economies, and in particular for the Caribbean and Central American, Central American economies, uh, although my colleagues at the bank um, haven't found a direct impact of exchange rate in remittances, they do find a countercyclical element to that behavior of worker, rem rem worker remittances. And in that sense, um, there could be, again, another impact there since most of our contractions are at least the one that we're experiencing right now and the one that we experienced in 2014 came hand in hand with a very strong depreciation. 
Uh, so I think that there's, uh, uh, once I read the financing part of this paper, I thought there's so, uh, a lot of other avenues for us small open economies that could be interesting, including parts that don't go into the current account part of the balance of payments, but the capital account of it. How do we finance this? Since we've also seen, seen a, a strong counter cyclical impact of pension fund flows, for instance, responding, or that's how we see it at least, to ex exchange rate expectations and dynamics. So um, I think that uh, for us, is this, this sort of works that explore deeper how the adjustments go are very, very important. And uh, uh, for us, it's actually interesting to see how they fit into our experiences and new avenues in which we can understand some other further roles of the exchange rate uh, movements that are not only the ones that we were usually attributing to exports. Um, so I, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, so now on to our final panelist. Um, so, so Hyun, um, you've done a lot of work on on how we should should rethink the accounting framework in, in international finance, and then go beyond the simplistic island economy model. So. So tell us about how that fits in with what what Gita has been been talking about. Well, thank you, Sumail. Um, well, first of all, thank um, thank you to Gita for the invitation and uh, congratulations on this um, on this great uh, staff discussion note uh, and congratulations to the whole team. Um, so, Sumail, I think the uh, the island economy um, analogy is a bit of a caricature, but the idea is that the global economy is a collection of islands where each island is a GDP area. And uh, when we look at the, uh, the external adjustment, we're looking at the uh, competitiveness of each island vis-a-vis -vis the rest. Um, and um, I think this um, uh, neglects the, the invoicing um, uh, element, as, as Keith has emphasized. And let me also uh, raise the issue of, um, of global firms, which I think uh, has always been there, but possibly has become more important over time. And it refers to both uh, Anna's discussion about the primary income account, but also something that Philip mentioned, which was on, uh, on multinational firms. Um, and let me see if I can just uh, share one slide. Um, so, you know, um, I think one thing to say is that global firms operate globally. They um, they employ workers in, uh, in various jurisdictions, so in many different islands, as it were. But uh, the income uh, uh, that's, uh, that's um, attributed to that firm uh, is you know, income to a particular island where it, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's domiciled. Um, and so if, the, if that global firm uh, earns profits and not all of it is distributed, that uh, undistributed profit um, becomes um, uh, part of the current account for that island. And uh, what we've seen is, if you look at this left-hand panel, um, if we look at a very long period uh, from 2007 to 2017, so over that 10-year period, if we ask um, uh, how does the change in uh, undistributed corporate profits, so that's uh, we, we know that by another name, which is corporate saving. Uh, corporate saving is the undistributed profits of companies, um, and then see how that relates to the change in the current account for that, uh, for that island, for that country. Uh, we do see that uh, you know, there is this uh, very striking relationship. Um, so um, when global firms are operating um, and uh, the current account through the, through the primary income account um, is influenced by uh, the the uh, corporate saving rate, uh, you do see that the current account balance and corporate savings are, are pretty well um, are pretty well aligned. But the other aspect um, that uh, that comes in when we have uh, global firms is that um, we may see a difference between. So, so we we often think of uh, global firms uh, that um, are headquartered in Island A that exports to island B um, as, as actually shipping the product from island A to island B. In other words, exports actually cross the border of, uh, of island A. 
Um, well, that's, uh, that's normally the case, but it need not be the case, especially uh, when you have you know, contract manufacturing. So, so uh, when uh, you have a global firm that is producing in one jurisdiction under contract, um, and then you sell the goods um, in a third jurisdiction, um, uh, the transfer of economic ownership happens when uh, the product is, is actually shipped. But it needn't uh, cross the shores of Island A. Um, and so you may have cases where there's a divergence between exports as measured um, by the value of goods that cross the border, uh, as opposed to exports that uh, uh, are recorded in the balance of payment. So just to give you a sense, uh, so here's an example um, that uh, that Philip and I discussed in a in a BIS quarterly review piece a couple of years ago, uh, which is for Ireland. Um, the blue is the balance of payments export uh, for Ireland, and the red is the customs-based export. And you, and you can see quite a big uh, deviation um, because of this idea that uh, if the uh, merchandise exports are happening under contract manufacturing and um, the, the goods are actually transferred um, um, uh, to a third country, and then even though the good never touches the shore um, of the exported country, it uh, is nevertheless recorded as an export uh, for that country. I mean, it's not as uh, so. I mean, uh, so Ireland is uh, um, is perhaps the best known case, but it's also um, the case that countries like Korea uh, and for Switzerland there are uh, there are so there is this deviation between the customs-based export. And the balance of payments based export. Uh, although for, for other currents, for other countries like the Czech Republic and Hungary, uh, the the divergence goes the other way. So um, so for the Czech Republic and for Hungary, they're a part of the uh, the the supply chain uh, in Europe. You you have the value of goods that cross the board being larger than the balance of payments export, uh, even for merchandise uh, exports. And I think this is you know one of the reasons why we need to be slightly careful when we, um, when we think about the external adjustment. I think this uh, really reinforces what Gita was saying, that in the short run, um, if we operate with the island economy model, where uh, we're thinking of each island um, um, as being a GDP area, and the external adjustment is purely by the competitiveness channel, we may be missing a very important element. Uh, and speaking of global value chains, I think the the other aspect, uh, and something that uh, that Gita didn't mention, um, is the impact on working capital costs. So if we think about working capital as being an integral, uh, if you like, a facilitator for um, for global trade, especially for intermediate goods trade, the financing cost may actually also enter through um, a um, the supply of credit channel. So not only the uh, uh, the the currency mismatch faced by the exporters, but more generally financial conditions, which we know uh, dance to the tune of the of the broad dollar index. And uh, I think that's also something that uh, might uh, play a role there as well. So which is also another element that could reinforce the uh, the invoicing channel as well as the um, um, uh, the exposure that the exporting firm itself has. So I think what I would conclude by saying, Sumaya, is that uh, if we um, if we can wean ourselves off the island economy model, uh, which I think is uh, it is ultimately very important, and I think it is it is going to exert itself eventually. But in the short run, uh, we have elements that that take us away from that model. Um, and global firms, uh, multinational firms, um, will be, I think, one uh, very important part of the story. So uh, let me stop there. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, uh, so first of all, I wanted just to ask Gita if uh, do you want to respond to anything the panelists um, have said? Uh, thank you. No, I just first wanted to thank Philip, uh, Anna, and Hyun for. Uh, you know, participating in this, and they're all individually experts on this topic, so it's a real privilege to have them uh, on this panel. Uh, a couple of points, so just 
So, uh, so Anna, I've, I've had the uh, fortune of working on Colombian data pretty closely on the trade front. Uh, and indeed, I mean, Colombia is ex also one of those countries, for instance, that same episode where you saw a big contraction in imports, you, you barely saw any increase in exports. So, you know, that's consistent with uh, the, uh, the asymmetric response, which is that most of the action comes through a, a, a collapse in imports, but not much of an increase in, in exports. I think a point uh, that all three of you made was also about, uh, uh, you know, thinking about the fi fi thinking about financial income, right? So, but besides the good trade, uh, what goes into the current account is also the financial income part, uh, and that that uh, you know can, for instance, generate very interesting uh, statistics on the current account front, which which is not associated with uh, actual exports of goods and services. So you have the income that you and Anna talked about, for instance, FDI profit remittances. Uh, Hewn talked about uh, uh, multinational firms and, what, and the income that they get there, or the high corporate savings rates, uh, because you happen to be a country where you get a lot of FDI. Uh, and Philip also mentioned that the Philip's uh, audio was not very clear. So, Philip, I'm sorry if I didn't, if I missed some of the important points that you made. Uh, but that's also you also talked about multinational uh, locations. Uh, and the decision of where to locate, and the effect that has. So, so you know, in the work that we've done, we've absolutely taken into account the presence of global value chains. We have a lot of work on that in this paper and in others. That has an important impact. Uh, so, certainly not thinking in terms of an island uh, economy. Uh, but I think the broader facts in terms of what happens when you have large exchange rate movements, and do you see a, a spurt in exports, which was kind of the traditional thinking uh, for a long time, was that you get a very large depreciation, you will get an export boom. It's something you just don't see for many countries in the short run in the data. Uh, and many of the evidence points to features of dominant currencies, but, but uh, like the panelists have said, there could be other features in there too. Um, and, uh, but yes, yeah, but that is a fact in the data. Okay, with that, I'm going to stop. Great, wonderful. Um, so uh, we have a few minutes um, in, this, in this segment. Um, so I have a, a question about, um, I guess what we know about why uh, firms are pricing in dollars. And, and so my question is, um, you know, clearly the decision to, to price in dollars is a choice made at the, the micro level that has these macro effects when everyone hurts. Um, does it matter why they're making that choice? for how we think about um, the response to an exchange rate shock? Sorry, to, to an external shock? Uh, uh, yes, yes, it does, uh, Samaya. So, so firstly, in terms of the reasons why countries tend to congregate on a common currency, an important uh, channel is the fact that most exporters are also importers, uh, which means that if you happen to be in a network where everybody you're buying from is selling to you in dollar terms, then you turn around and you want to price, then to make sure that your costs and your revenues are, are, are more aligned, you're going to price in, uh, in dollar terms yourself. It's the intermediate input channel that plays an important role in uh, pricing in, in, in certain dominant currencies. Uh, that, that also ties into the financing aspect, which is, why is it that you can have so much of international financing that also gets done in dollar terms? Uh, and the argument, one argument there is, it, for a lot of these countries, it's cheaper to finance yourself in dollar terms. Dollar interest rates are cheaper than even exchange rate adjusted uh, in relative to their own home currencies. And why is that? It's because of a safe asset premium on, on dollars, on dollar assets. And so, you have, where does a safe asset premium come from? It comes, one of the important channels it comes from is the fact that there's a big part of the world that relies on goods that they import from the rest of the world that are priced in dollars. And so if you want to keep your consumption relatively stable when your exchange rate moves around, saving in dollar terms is a good hedge. So there's a big demand for dollar safe assets, which then generates the safe premium, which then makes it cheaper to borrow in dollar terms. So the question of, how this matters, the details do matter because 
if the reason you're pricing in dollar terms is because your imports are in dollar terms, then it means that when the currency depreciates, the profit impact is not that big. I mean, if you sound as if you're making very big profits because your costs are going up too at the same time that your revenues are going up. But if on the other hand, the reason you're pricing in dollars is because all your competitors are pricing in dollars and you don't want to lose market share when your exchange it moves around, then you're going to get a bigger effect on the profitability. And then that's going to have effects on your exports uh, going forward. So that, has more, that will more likely stimulate export uh, going forward. So the details do matter. Wonderful. Okay, great. Um, so ne next we're going to go to a very uh, distinguished front row. Um, so first of all, uh, I'm hoping to hear from Barry Eichen Green of the University of California, Berkeley, uh, whose book on global currencies is very much on my desk. Thank you, Samaya. I think the, uh, the paper and the report are a tour de force and profoundly depressing. Uh, they're a tour de force in the sense that they uh, contain theory and uh, sophisticated empirical work, but also the new data set that Gita spoke of that uh, a lot of us will be anxious to get our hands on. The, but the conclusion to my mind is de depressing because it, uh, it implies that monetary policy is less effective than we have traditionally thought in a world where sterilized uh, intervention doesn't do much, um, uh, monetary policy and exchange rate movements go together. When you're at the zero lower bound, monetary policy works even more heavily by moving the exchange rate because it can't move the, uh, the interest rate. And if it really is the case that you get less stimulus to exports and less oomph from monetary policy generally, I think it's incumbent on all of us to think about what to do instead. So is, is this project an argument for fiscal policy? That's depressing because fiscal policy is heavily politicized. Um, fiscal policy works with even longer lags typically than monetary policy. What do we need to do in terms of reforming our fiscal institutions if we're going to have to rely on them more heavily? And second part of the question would be, what do we have to do to get out of this position of dollar dominance because it has the undesirable effect of weakening monetary policy and it will run up sooner or later against the 21st century Triffin dilemma problem? Wonderful. Okay, great. Um, so next we are going to hear from Valentina Bruno of, of American University. Me unmute. Okay, I am unmute. Can you hear me? Perfect. So thank you, Sumaya, for uh, uh, for uh, for this. And uh, I'm just gonna uh, make a brief remark about uh, comparing the uh, financial channel and the invoicing channel. Uh, um, the financial channel is about uh, the broad dollar index, and there is now a growing uh, uh, literature uh, on how a stronger dollar in terms of uh, uh, broad dollar index uh, has taken over uh, the VIX uh, as the wonder variable uh, capturing uh, the risk bearing capacity of, uh, of banks uh, and asset managers. And uh, as Gita explained in her presentation, uh, the invoicing channel is about the bilateral uh, exchange rate of the export destination country vis-a-vis uh, -vis the dollar. Now, um, there are different predictions uh, between the invoicing channel and the financial channel of the dollar. So, for instance, in my paper presented at the MBR Summer Institute a couple of weeks ago, which benefited, benefited among others, uh, from Linda Goldberg's uh, comment, uh, uh, so, in, in, in my paper, both of the broad dollar index and the bilateral dollar exchange rate of, um, show up uh, as uh, depressing uh, exports when the dollar is strong. So, if you want, uh, the cleanest test uh, is uh, exports uh, to the United States because the export destination country uses the dollar, and so invoicing uh, really doesn't matter. Uh, 
So, but still, uh, uh, or oh, sorry, invoicing channel doesn't apply. But still, a stronger dollar in terms of broad dollar index depresses exports to the US. So I think that the punchline of all of this is that the financial channel matters for exports through the working capital channel and the supply of dollar credit, as you mentioned. And it matters in addition to the invoicing channel. So if you want, is another instance of, the, of our motto that uh, uh, what happens in financial markets doesn't stay in financial markets, but it does have uh, consequences for uh, the real economy. And I stop here. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Thank so you. next we have Oleg Ipofi, of, uh, who's a professor at UCLA. Thank you very much. So this is a super exciting topic, obviously, and it's quite amazing um, how much progress has been made over a very short period of time, both in terms of theory and empirics. I, uh, so Maya, please stop me when I run out of time. I wanted to make a couple of points. Um, so the first one that I find very interesting is the interplay between dominant currency use and pricing uh, and the use of dollar as an anchor, the use of dollar as a peg anchor for a lot of countries. So if you look uh, in terms of uh, what countries do, about 80 countries in the world use dollar as a, either a dirty peg or a crawling peg or a full out trade peg. And in that sense, there is an interesting feedback between the two. And actually in a recent empirical work, Sir Dima Mukin has shown that there is this interesting two-way feedback that if more firms are doing dollar pricing, more governments will have the incentive to peg stronger to the dollar. And once, once countries peg to the dollar, more firms will want to actually use the dollar in trade. And in that sense, it's very difficult to separate the two. Uh, and so what's interesting actually in the current world architecture is that China, the biggest trade partner of most countries, is actually doing um, a systematic pact to the dollar, right? And in, in that sense, it's not just the weight of the US and the trade of the US that uh, kind of incentivizes firms to use the dollar, but it's also the fact that uh, they trade a lot with China by imported inputs from China, uh, which is also pegged to the dollar. And many, many other countries also pegged to the dollar. And in that sense, we're in this stable equilibrium where dollar is used both by firms and as an anchor by the government. And so the interesting question is how this equilibrium might start to adjust as, for example, China goes off the peg from the US dollar. And it can have a profound effect on the incentives for firms to change the currency of pricing, right? So this is the first point that I was I was going to make. The second point I wanted to talk about quantities, right? So the, the theory of dominant currency pricing works beautifully for prices. So indeed, we can look at the data, we can look at the micro data, and first of all, we can see how the firms are making the choices to price in one currency versus the other. And what's interesting, there is a lot of heterogeneity across firms, and so the country sector characteristics explain less than a half of what currency is adopted. And it's actually oftentimes the firm characteristics within countries and sectors that explain better what currency is, is adopted. In fact, the interesting pattern that we find it's, it's the larger firms uh, that adopt the dollar. And a lot of the smaller firms do producer currency pricing, but it's, 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 it's the large firms which account for most of the trade, are part of the global value uh, chains, are big exporters and big importers at the same time. And these are the firms that adopt, uh, adopt dollars. So now, interestingly, you can look whether it affects the behavior of their quantities. And so what we see in the data is that quantities respond very little to price movements. What, 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 I mean, it's been a known fact that when you look in the time series, the elasticity of quantity response is quite low. And uh, so we're working with, uh, with this data from Belgium now where we can actually look at the dynamics of it and we can kind of compare the Belgian firm that does dollars versus the Belgian firms that does euros export into third destinations. And what's amazing, in the short run, you don't see differential quantity response. That quantity response starts to build up over time. And so a year out, we can see a differential quantity response. But a year out, uh, the sticky prices start to wear out. And so it's very interesting that the data seems to be a combination of both the price frictions and the quantity frictions. And, right, and so when we talk about quantity frictions, it's kind of interesting. We don't have a good handle on what's behind those quantity frictions. It could be that the contracts are written ahead of time and quantities are fixed for the next year. 
Uh, it could be that uh, there are other types of quantitative friction adjustments, for example, like you cannot really easily adjust on extensive margin your supplier, and on intensive margin there is only that limited room to adjust. Right, but the other interesting thing is that it could be that we live in a world of a combination of layers of price stickiness. So, for example, that you are sticking dollars at the border, but then you're sticking in the local currency to the consumer, to the final consumer who decide on quantities, right? And so, as a result, the border prices are sticking dollars, but the quantities adjust little because the person who makes the decision about the quantities actually faces uh, sticky prices in his local currency, right? And so we have good evidence from Ariel Burstyn and co-authors that that's true for retailer. So the retail, like if, if it's final goods that go directly to retailers, to consumers, that's a good model of it. So I think where we actually miss the data a lot is what happens in firm to firm trade. Are firms particularly responsive in the quantities that they purchase in the price at the border or in the price that they you know, ultimately face in whatever currency that is? And so I think this is where I think from what I understand, this is where the data is missing so far, and it's sort of the piece that I would kind of be very curious to know about. So let me stop here. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so a final um, uh, super uh, quizzer um, before we go back to the panelists to get um, sort of reflections and answers to some of those. Um, so next we have uh, an academic who, who helps to make uh, currency invoicing cool uh, with her work in the mid 2000s. Uh, we have Linda Goldberg at the New York Fed. So uh, thank you very much. Um, I first want to congratulate the IMF and also the ECB on this initiative um, on getting uh, so much uh, fascinating uh, data together. And um, Gita mentioned it, but I want to underscore what you know progress we have here, which is they now have information that covers 102 countries for um, up to 30 years um, of data. And really for the first time, you have an extensive window into developing uh, countries and emerging markets that we really had not had uh, in a comprehensive way uh, before. So really this is a, a tour de force, um, as Barry mentioned. Um, now, What's interesting um, there, um, and here's my first question, is that despite the changing roles of so many countries in the global economy, uh, despite changes in production networks, uh, trade developments, different kinds of uh, you know regional uh, uh, or multilateral agreements, there has been remarkable stability uh, in dollar invoicing shares, and Gita mentioned uh, some of the reasons for that. Um, but I guess the question I'd really like to hear from the panelists about is, you know, what type of changes um, and how much larger would those changes have to be uh, for there to be uh, disruption to this uh, system and you know Barry had mentioned uh, related to this as did Oleg. So that's my my first question is, um, you know, what would in a way break this? Um, my second uh, question um, is more of a request actually, which is um, you know a number of uh, our speakers here have mentioned these financing channels, uh, the ECB for. Uh, I don't know, Philip could tell me, but I think probably for about 15 years now has the international role of the U.S. Um, there's some wonderful data out there, but not comprehensive data on the financing side counterpart to the trade invoicing. So a lot of channels through which uh, different currencies are used for financing different kinds of short run, medium run, long run transactions. Some uh, take into account the role of banks, some are market-based uh, funding channels, some trade finance, working capital. Um, is there any hope of having a comprehensive global database uh, that tells us the use of currencies in financing? And then likewise, what are your expectations on how stable that kind of feature of the international monetary system are? So those are my questions for the panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so now, um, uh, so I actually have, uh, well, we have a set of questions there. And so um, 
we're going to I'm going to ask each panelist to to um, respond. Um, there's also a, a kind of a question or a comment that's come in from the audience. So from Juan Jose sorry Echavarria, um, who is the governor of the Central Bank of Colombia, um, and so he has a comment for Gita. Uh, and so he says, Colombian exports were very responsive to the exchange rate some decades ago, but they're, they're not so anymore. Um, however, exports have always been denominated in US dollars. So question mark, what's what's going on there? Um, so Gita, should we start with you and then I'll and then I'll uh, grill Philip on his plans for, for building data sets. Thank you. Uh, again, great. Great sets of uh, comments. There is, I mean, the point. I think the point that Valentina and Oleg are making, I think, basically says we need we can delve in much more. We need to delve in much more deeply into these mechanisms. Uh, and you know, we have besides the balance sheet mismatch channel, there's a whole working capital aspect which can also play a role, uh, and these have to be explored. I mean, to Oleg, I would actually take the evidence from Ariel Burstein as showing that the invoicing currency at the border makes a big difference for uh, purchases at the retail margin, because as he shows, for Switzerland, everything that was importing in Swiss franc, you saw almost no expenditure switching, but for exports that were that they were importing in euro terms, they actually saw significant export switching. Now, there is an attenuation effect, but I, I think his results were consistent with the, with the invoicing mapping at the retail level that uh, connected to the border. To the uh, question about, I think this is both Linda and Barry's uh, question about, you know, how do we, how, you know, what, what generates, what will generate a change in the current international financial regime of, um, of strong dollar dominance. Now, there are strong network effects uh, that make uh, having a dominant currency, sustain having a dominant currency. People like to trade with each other in a common currency. Uh, they uh, want to keep their prices relatively stable relative to their competitors. Their intermediate input channel plays a role. Uh, and then there's the financing channel. All of these reinforce each other. Now, uh, of course, it's, it was the case that there was a British pound that was the major currency in the past, and now uh, it's the dollar. And as Barry says, there were times in the middle when you had even more than one currency being the dominant currency. I think the factor that would now, – now, firstly, the, the network effects are strong. There is strong inertia in getting away from an equilibrium that currently exists. And I think an important factor is going to be the existence of viable alternatives. Uh, and so, among the set of currencies, the euro is clearly the the, uh, the, uh, the next competitor in terms of uh, its market share in all of these different areas. Uh, and the stronger the euro uh, is, in the sense of the, the the stronger the whole euro area resilience is, the stronger the uh, integration is in terms of having. A common banking, a banking union, a capital markets union, a central fiscal capacity. I mean, all of this will only enhance the attractiveness uh, of the euro. Uh, so, so, and to the question on um, Juan Jose Caveria, I I would need to understand what the fact is because the statement I made was specifically about manufacturing uh, exports. You know, as we know, Colombia is overwhelmingly, but 50% of its exports are oil. So I don't know whether we mean something about exports as a total, or this is about manufacturing exports. So I'm going to have to study this a little bit, the fact, historically. What I've looked at, for whatever duration I've looked at, manufacturing exports have been have been not been very responsive. Wonderful. Um, Philip, do you want to respond to requests for more data? Sure. Well, another uh, joint uh, project of the ECB and the IMF earlier this year which you can find on the respective websites is a new data set on uh, the kind of use of currencies in, in uh, balance sheets. Now, of course, it's, it's a kind of compilation of all sorts of different techniques. And I suppose in the end, uh, whenever I've looked at this, this issue, 
a very important issue is, is uh, uh, the distinction between uh, where you raise money and then uh, uh, through currency hedging, uh, who bears the risk? So, of course, we know uh, various countries raise a lot of money in dollars, but the extent then it's swapped out. So they, they raised, as Peter said, it's super cheap because of the convenience uh, premium and so on to, to raise money in dollars. But it, you, know, you, you don't necessarily want to keep that risk. Uh, and so it's very interesting. And the big missing question to me, Linda, is who in the end is bearing that risk? Because we, we know it's the world's investment banks or the arrangers, but who is bearing that uh, risk is, I think, very interesting. But, you know, there are some natural uh, uh, customers for that, I think. I mean, I think uh, Oleg uh, raised a big issue. And uh, historically, there was an issue about uh, this interaction between who pegs to the dollar and then the popularity of the dollar as an invoicing currency. And the big, uh, there's two big structural breaks. One happened uh, 20 years ago, but of course the data set by and large only goes back 20 years, which is the creation of the euro. You know, there was a lot of uh, switching around the time of the creation of the euro uh, in terms of uh, the currency of invoice uh, from the point of view of the smaller countries at least. And then uh, at some point, I suppose, uh, to the extent we do see China moving to uh, inflation target or more completely to inflation targeting, uh, then it's going to be very interesting about having this multipolar world. Maybe the, the last comment is uh, responding to Barry Eichengreen. I don't think it says monetary policy is limited. It just says uh, to be effective, you need to have really large exchange rate movements. So, this, so then you, you have two responses to that. One is living with really large exchange rate movements, or two, if you can't, form a monetary union. Uh, and, you know, uh, because that, that, that was, you know, you and others in the 1990s would have said that. Maybe the political economy of sustaining large exchange rate movements is tricky. And the alternative is essentially to give up uh, the national monetary policy in favour of sharing a dominant currency, which I think is the, was the European uh, response. Uh, let me stop there. Um, sorry, Gita, do you want, just want to respond to some of the other the other questions that came up as well? Yes, and thanks, Omey. I know I was. Uh, uh, I just realised that I didn't answer this question that Barry asked about what does this mean? Does this mean that you do more fiscal? And so this is actually very related to this other work, work stream we have on the integrated policy framework. Uh, and there what you see is that, you know, this is the case when you have dominant currency pricing, you don't get the export stabilization piece. Then in that case, you know, it, there is really not much, fiscal policy is not going to help you in that case. It's not really going to solve the, the pricing friction problem. And so you don't really, it doesn't really call for fiscal policy. I think what it tells you more is that in some circumstances that can, it can imply greater exchange rate volatility. Uh, and given that that's the case, you can see an argument why ex ante countries might want to be a little more cautious about their exchange of foreign currency exposure, at least for instance, through the financial channel. And those are the kind of arguments that uh, come in, which also kind of tie, leads me to this point that Oleg made about countries pegging to the dollar in a regime of this kind. Uh, and so that's kind of interesting because in some circumstances you want, if anything, the exchange rate to be even more, you know, kind of to move by a lot. And so pegging is not necessarily the right thing to do in that world, but that's an, I'll have to, I'll have to see exactly where that argument comes from. Anna, do you want to respond? How depressed are you about um, uh, the efficacy of, of monetary policy? Yes, I, I would go rather on the, towards the side of what just Gita mentioned. For us, what it has basically meant is that in this higher volatility scenario for exchange rate, it has required, let's call it a precondition for us, uh, or things that we have to really take care of. And one of them is to uh, have low currency mismatches. What you saw in the slides that I presented is the just the result of the of the incentive scheme that the volatility of the exchange rate presents to the corporate sector. But on the financial side of the world, we have very strong regulations that actually impede any such currency mismatches so that we can allow uh, for this greater uh, current exchange rate volatility. And um, probably to Linda's point, I was just thinking that. For instance, for, for the, the largest part of our trade partners, we don't have any sort of bilateral 
uh, currency market, not even for the euro, actually. So in the case of the Colombian peso, you always have to go to the dollar. And then when you go to the financing part of things, you're always trying to sort of compensate. Well, if we were to abandon a bit of this uh, dollar invoicing, then in the financing part, you're not going to find an easy way of financing or hedging uh, if that financing were to be provided. So I don't actually know if uh, in some ways we are at a trade-off point in which there are some efficiencies uh, and that those would be lost. Maybe because of my own biases, uh, uh, the financial stability side of everything is so important that I'd, I'd rather be on the side in which this financing finds uh, appropriate hedgings and therefore maybe this other elasticity that we're losing of, uh, the, the, it does cost, but I don't know whether the counterfactual world would be would be a better place for us. Thank you. Great. Okay. Well, we have zero minutes left. Um, so, Hyun, do you want to to wrap up very very quickly with some you know thirty seconds summaries of what you've been hearing? I just have a thirty second go at Barry's uh, big question. Um, I think the um, so Barry the um, uh, for sovereign borrowers, at least, uh, you know, they have well and truly overcome uh, original sin, uh, you know, the, the notion that you coined uh, with Ricardo Hausman. But for corporates, they still very much are subject to original sin. And I think it's very closely related to, to the invoicing channel, actually. Uh, so I think the, uh, Peter mentioned the uh, mutual dependence between firms from an I.O. sense, but I think there is also a financing and real side dependence as well, in that um, if you're invoicing in dollars, the working capital is in dollars, the firms therefore are, be uh, are best off borrowing in dollars, and then the asset managers hold dollar claims because the borrowers borrow in dollars, and then the banks provide dollar credit in order to hedge the currency risk. And so you, you have this layering, uh, which uh, builds from this underlying real economy uh, feature. And so, um, this uh, mutual dependence that Gita mentioned, I think, is not simply between firms. It's also at the various different layers of the financial system as well. So let me just finish on that. Great. Everything is very complicated and connected to to each other. Um, and you know what I'm hearing is lots and lots of more opportunities for research. Um, so with that, I'm going to let everyone get on with their day and with this feast of things to think about. Um, and thanks to everyone for organizing.